So it's my pleasure to introduce our second keynote speaker of the day, uh, Kara Wu. She's going to be talking about contributing to our packages. Let's welcome Kara. Thanks, Chester, for that introduction. Um, so as Chester said, I'm going to be talking today about contributing to our packages. Um, but I want to start with a question. So um, how many people in this room have struggled writing R, whether it was hitting an error message you didn't understand, yeah, the hands are going up, lack of documentation for a package that you wanted to use, um, or just something where things weren't working the way they were supposed to. Um, so I saw a lot of hands, and I would be very surprised if not everyone in this room who has used R has had this experience. Um, so I want to ask, have any of you reported uh, bugs or issues to the maintainer of a package? A few hands, okay, but a lot fewer. Um, and then if you've reported those bugs, have they ended up getting fixed? Yeah, a lot of yeah. Okay, awesome. So I want to talk about contributing to our packages and why, if you're in this room today, um, you can start contributing to the packages that you use on a daily basis, even if you've never written an R package before in your life, which I think is probably likely a lot of people in this room. And my hope is that um, by the end of this talk, you'll come away feeling like you can make valuable contributions to the R packages that you use in your daily work, um, and that you'll see some reasons why you might want to do that. So as we've seen, like everyone struggles with writing R. Um, programming is not easy, and I think a lot of us in the R community especially come to it sort of indirectly. Um, and folks you know, touched on this earlier um, in other talks and in the panel discussion, um, but one of the things that I think is really special about the R community is the incredible diversity and in backgrounds of the people who are, who are typically writing R. Um, I think a very small proportion of us have um, formal backgrounds in computer science or software engineering. Um, and so there's this incredible diversity of really amazing work being done in R uh, by people in all kinds of different fields. And I think that's one of the really um, great strengths of the R community. Um, my own journey in R began about six years ago. Uh, I, had taken an R, uh, I had taken a statistics class where I learned a little bit of R, um, and I found myself needing to use it in my work uh, managing data on uh, Siberian plankton. Um, so this is us in the field in Siberia, and I you know, was writing R, but I didn't, really, um, I didn't really think of myself at that time as like a computer person. Um, I, my, that statistics class was my first exposure to programming, um, and I was using it sort of uh, just out of necessity. Um, but over time, I, I was able to learn enough that I could teach others, teach my colleagues, and teach other people, um, and blog sporadically about things that I had learned. And through getting involved in this larger R community, I ended up last year with the opportunity to work as an intern on the ggplot2 package. And this was me on day one of my internship on ggplot2. Um, I had used ggplot to make plots many times before, but I had never once looked into the underlying code. I had no idea how it worked, um, and I was uh, a bit petrified, to be honest. But I spent the summer digging around in the code um, with some guidance from, from Hadley Wickham as well, of course, but also um, just trying to figure out a lot of things on my own. Um, and by this point, I'm a little bit more like this. And in working on ggplot2, I developed some strategies for how to get familiar with unfamiliar code when I don't know what it's doing, as well as some thoughts on different ways that uh, people can contribute to packages beyond just writing new code for the package. Um, and most importantly, I saw how much the community of people who maintain our packages really needs and relies on contributions from the people who use those packages. The R community has blossomed so much in recent years um, that there's this huge wealth of resources from doing all kinds of work from data wrangling and visualization to incredibly like, specific and niche uh, methods of statistical analysis. There are over 12,000 packages now hosted on CRAN, not to mention many more packages that are hosted on Bioconductor or GitHub. Um, and so the odds are good that if you're trying to do something in R, someone has written a package to do it. If you want to make the color scheme of your plots look like a Wes Anderson movie, there's a package for that. Um, yet as we've seen, there are still uh, challenges and there's still friction for people using these packages. 
Um, and the packages themselves are, like anything, imperfect. They are written by a somewhat smaller number of human individuals, um, the majority of whom are not paid to write our packages as a job. So there are bugs, there's missing documentation, um, and more generally, there's much more work to be done um, than the authors and maintainers of the packages can take on by themselves. So taking ggplot2 as an example, um, I'm now one of a handful of authors on the ggplot2 package. Currently, only one of those people is paid um, to work on ggplot2. That's Hadley Wickham, who, as you may know, has like a handful of other packages that he's also responsible for. Um, and there's a great ggplot2 intern working this summer, but um, in general, most of us who are working uh, regularly on this package are doing so around day jobs and family responsibilities and, um, and other life stuff. Um, and so, and yet in ggplot2 is incredibly widely used. Um, we have now over 2,000 packages that depend on it. Um, and from the RStudio CRAN mirror alone, it was downloaded over 400,000 times last month. Um, and so it's, it's incredibly widely used. We have this um, huge user base and we rely really heavily on members of that community to make contributions and to let us know when things are broken um, or confusing because no matter how thoroughly we test every change, it's just not possible for us to anticipate every, uh, every possible scenario. And so my very first involvement actually in ggplot2 long before I was an intern was reporting a bug where I was trying to make um, stacked area charts where you would have like three sections of a, tr of a plot um, stacked on top of one another. I was doing some um, research on how people perceive these types of charts. And I found this bug where the sections, instead of stacking neatly one on top of each other, were kind of um, occluding one another. And so um, I, I reported this bug to the ggplot2 issue tracker, and a few months later it got fixed by the first ggplot2 intern. Um, so like I said, we need people to tell us when things go wrong, and we need people to contribute to the fixes. And so that is where all of you come in. So why should someone consider contributing to our packages? If I don't get paid to write our packages as a job, why should I spend my time on that? I think that there are several reasons why um, it's worth considering contributing to packages. The first reason is that you're trying to use the package for something and it's not working or it's not working the way that you think that it should. Um, and so you can contribute to, to a package to add something that meets your own needs or solves a problem that you have. And in doing so, you're also likely going to solve the problem for other people who may be experiencing the same issue. Contributing to a package is also a way to get opportunities for possible you know, job offers down the line or co collaborations with other people in the community. Um, actually, the original, the first ggplot2 intern, um, Thomas Lynn Peterson, got that internship directly as a result of contributions that he was already making to ggplot2. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities that can come about uh, if you're regularly involved in this kind of work. If you're someone who enjoys teaching, there are a lot of opportunities to share knowledge through the context of contributing to packages, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on what I mean by that, but in general, contributing to packages is a way to get involved in a community where you can take turns giving and receiving help, and that can be really rewarding. And lastly, perhaps the most valuable reason to contribute is as a learning experience for yourself. Um, the ways of contributing to packages that I am going to show are going to help you not only deepen your own understanding of other people's packages, but also um, become more effective in your own work in R, whether that's your own packages, um, scripts, shiny apps, or anything else. Um, and I, I just really can't overstate how much I've learned personally about R from reading other people's packages and trying to make contributions to them. So those are the reasons why I think that you should consider contributing to our packages. But I recognize that it can be a very daunting prospect, um, especially if you've never written an R package before. Um, or even if you have, it can still be difficult to figure out what's going on in someone else's code. Um, a lot of packages are very big and complex, and uh, it's hard to figure out you know, what, what, what's going on there under the hood. I know that I also have experienced like a lot of stress and anxiety about the social um, interactions around uh, contributing to packages, but it doesn't have to be that way, and I'm hoping that I can demystify that process a little bit. 
I think that some folks feel like they need to be like super elite R programmers before they can make valuable contributions. Um, and that's actually really not the case. Um, and in fact, I would say that it's uh, very rarely advisable to start contributing to packages by writing a whole bunch of complicated code and sending it off to someone um, to incorporate into their package. Um, and the reason that this is true has to do with the very specific responsibilities that maintainers of R packages, and especially packages that are really widely used, take on. Because every feature that gets contributed or added to a package not only needs to work in that moment, it needs to continue working into the future indefinitely in a variety of different circumstances that are impossible to anticipate in advance and in conjunction with other packages and other pieces of code um, that exist in, in, that, um, in that code base. And so in this way, contributing code to someone else's package can be a little bit like giving someone a puppy. Um, so puppies are great. The person that you're giving the puppy to might love puppies. And still, once you hand over that puppy, your responsibility for it is over, and the person you're giving it to takes it on indefinitely. And so at the very least, like it's worth having a conversation with them about whether they're receptive to puppies. And maybe if they already have a lot of puppies to take care of, like you can give them some chew toys or puppy treats instead. Um, OK, so writing a bunch of code and just you know, sending it off uh, out of the blue is not the best way to get started for these puppy-related reasons. Um, so what are some ways to get involved in packages that will be helpful both for you and for the um, maintainers of the packages that you're working on? The first and the probably easiest way is to open issues on GitHub. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with GitHub, I don't want to you know, make too many assumptions about, um, about people's background. Um, so GitHub is a site where many open source projects in R and other languages are developed. Um, and so it will look sort of like this. An R package can be hosted on GitHub. Um, and when people encounter a bug or want to propose a new feature, uh, they can open what's called an issue, which um, they're listed on this issues tab that I have an arrow to. Um, and opening issues in a package is a great contribution uh, because no matter how thoroughly the package developers have tested their work, um, it's always possible for other things to go wrong. So it's um, really helpful to have community input on uh, when that happens. And so going back to my original ggplot2 example, like when I hit this problem, I opened an issue on GitHub where I provided the data and code necessary to recreate the problem, um, and that allowed the issue to get fixed. The secret to writing issues on GitHub is the minimal reproducible example, or reference. Um, so this should be the minimal code and data necessary to recreate the problem that you're seeing. Um, and it should be possible to like directly copy and paste that code from the GitHub issue into a fresh R session and have it run and produce the same output. There's a package to do to create reprexes called Reprex, um, written by Jenny Bryan. And that's, um, that is, in my opinion, like the way to, to write reprexes to be posted to GitHub. So if I have a snippet of code like this, um, where I am loading the ggplot2 package and making a scatter plot of the empty cars data, to turn this into a reprex, I would highlight this code, um, copy it onto my clipboard, then call the function reprex, and that would spit back onto my clipboard um, some text that looks like this, um, which has some sort of confusing little markup things there, but when I paste that, into the GitHub issue, um, GitHub will interpret that and render it into this nicely formatted issue containing the code in a nicely formatted way and even embedding plots which um, were automatically uploaded and the link was pulled down by the reprex package. Um, so it really, really makes it incredibly um, streamlined to, to turn your code into a reproducible example. And the minimal part of minimal reproducible example is really important because it helps you isolate what is at the core of the problem um, and removes any extraneous details. And then reproducible is important because um, it's, that's what allows other people to recreate your problem and to know when, it, when they have fixed it. And so you may witness package developers being like a little bit persnickety about the format of GitHub issues and requiring reproducible examples. Um, and in these cases, it's helpful to remember that, um, again, most people who develop R packages are not getting paid to do so. 
and those who are may have hundreds or thousands of open issues to respond to. And so the easier that you can make it um, to, for someone else to recreate your problem, the more likely it is that they'll be able to take the time to fix it. So ultimately, a GitHub issue should provide a reproducible, clean, and parsimonious argument um, that the problem that you're seeing is a real problem and that it's worth, fi worth fixing. And I think that distilling, uh, distilling this problem down to its simplest form is a strategy that is also really useful in um, in day-to-day -day R programming where if I run into a problem that I am a little bit confused by, I can kind of slowly pair out what are the, the details that are unrelated and, f and find the core of the problem, and that makes it a lot easier to fix. So the next thing that you can do um, is is to survey existing issues on GitHub um, and see if there are any that you can either help with or, uh, or help clarify. Um, so sometimes issues get open on packages for things that are not actually bugs, but um, errors in the code um, or questions about the package. And so if you can take other people's code, run it, um, and see if you can reproduce their problem or address their question, that is a really useful and valuable contribution. And if they haven't provided a reproducible example, um, and you can figure out what it is that they're, that they're trying to convey, you could create a reproducible example and add it to the issue. Um, and that is like a really saintly contribution to make. Like that is incredibly appreciated. Sometimes too, you can add additional information to a GitHub issue that can help um, r with resolving the problem. So this is um, an example of an issue that was opened recently in the per package where the um, person who opened the issue identified a place where uh, two function arguments were being called in the wrong order and this was um, leading to problems. And uh, Christoph here was able to add to this issue by pointing out um, why the test for that package hadn't caught the issue and also to put this behavior in context with other related functions to confirm that like this was really a bug, that other functions were working in a different way than this one particular one. Okay, so those are two methods of contributing via GitHub issues um, that don't involve making any changes to like the package uh, itself at all, uh, but they're still really valuable and helpful. And now um, I want to get into some of the ways that you can contribute to um, like the actual files within a package, and I think one of the best ways to get started with this is with documentation. In many R packages, the source of the documentation lives in specially formatted comments that are right above the function definitions themselves, and they look like this. Um, so if I have a typo in my documentation where parameter x is described as the first number instead of the first number, um, you know, you as the package user could go in and make that change and fix it right there, and so then suggest it back to me. So if you spot typos in documentation, uh, or things that are confusing or inaccurate or missing examples, um, you can fix all of those and then propose the change through what's called a pull request on GitHub, um, which is a way of proposing changes to, um, to an existing code base. Um, so I think that this documentation fixes are one of the easiest ways to get started with actually making changes to a package um, and contributing back to the authors. And I do this very often now. Um, this was a recent pull request that I submitted to the LaCroix color package, um, which allows you to create LaCroix-based color palettes for your plots. Um, and they had a typo in their readme where uh, LaCroix flavors was uh, misspelled as LaCroix falvers. Um, so I created a pull request and, and um, fixed that typo for them, and, and that got merged. So these kinds of contributions that I have described so far are all really highly appreciated. And more than that, they start to build up this relationship of trust between you and, the, um, and whoever maintains the package that you're contributing to. I think um, open source development can sometimes feel like this very impersonal process because you may not know the people who are maintaining the software that you're contributing to. You may never have synchronous conversations with them. But at its core, it's still a social process that's built on trust. Um, and so by making small contributions first, you can start to build up that relationship of trust with the developers who will over time come to see and recognize you as someone who is interested and invested in the project. And at the same time, that gives you the opportunity to slowly get to know how the package works, um, you know, bit by bit instead of trying to tackle it all at once. 
Okay, so what if you're ready to start contributing to a package, um, to the actual code within the package in the form of fixing a bug? How do you get started with that? And I, I said, I promised in my abstract that I was gonna like share a few tips for um, finding your way in, um, in unfamiliar packages. And so, um, so I'll kind of give that process, at least the way that I usually um, approach it. And the first thing to do in this case is to start with an issue. So if, there, um, if, you're, if you're seeing a bug in a package that you want to try to fix, um, you want to start with an issue to make sure that the maintainer of the package is uh, receptive to the fix, um, or otherwise take an existing issue um, and, and um, start working on that one. Um, but either way, you want to have an issue so that you know that the, um, there's, there's openness to this fix before you spend too much time working on it. Some packages will have issue labels indicating um, issues that the maintainer wants help with and or that are good first issues, which is usually an indication that this issue um, is likely to be like relatively easily fixed um, without kind of a, a sprawling changes throughout the package. Um, so if you're the repository that you're looking at has those labels, um, those are a good place to start. And otherwise, you might just need to pick one that seems interesting and doable and give it a try. You may not figure it, figure it out, but that's okay. Um, so here's my general strategy for trying to become a bug detective and diagnose the source of a bug. Um, other people may have other strategies, but this is, this is what I typically do. So the first thing that I do when I'm trying to figure out why I'm getting some error, or some, something strange is happening, is to find and read the function that I have called. Um, so I can do this either on, by finding the function on GitHub or downloading a copy of the, of the code and browsing it in our studio or my text editor of choice. But I read the function itself and see if I can figure out what it does based on the code and the documentation for that function. Usually this is not enough for me to figure out what is causing a bug, um, but it's a good start to help me figure out, okay, what is it that this function is actually supposed to be doing? From there, I'll often go kind of forwards and backwards and look at what functions the function I'm looking at uses within itself, and also try to find places in the package where this function is being used. Um, and I do that through basically searching on GitHub or within the text of the package. Um, but it's generally, I find it helpful to um, just get the kind of landscape of what context is, uh, is this function being used in um, and what is it doing. And then step three involves using R's tools for debugging. So I'm curious, um, from a show of hands, like how many people in this room have used either the traceback or debug functions or like similar ones? Okay, so some, some people, um, but not most. And, and I, so I personally had never used these functions before I started working on ggplot. And now they're so absolutely indispensable to me that I don't understand how I ever figured out anything in R before I used them um, because they're such a core part of my daily life and workflow. Um, so when you encounter an error message in R, calling the function traceback will show you what's called the call stack. Um, and this is essentially all, the list of all the functions that have been called from the one that you typed down to exactly where some error occurred. So if I am using a function that calls another function, that calls another function, that calls another function, and the error is being thrown by some function like eight functions deep, um, traceback will show me that whole sequence of functions so that I can start to identify where exactly was it that this problem occurred. And then debug is a really nice complement to traceback because it allows you to view into the black box of a function and see step by step what is happening within that function when it is being called. Um, so much like in an interactive R session, you might uh, explore the structure of an object by viewing the first few lines of data or viewing the structure. Um, you can do the same within a function call using the, using the debug function. And then you can step through each line of code and find exactly where it is that the problem is occurring. And so in this way, you can often find cases where the function that you're using is getting data that doesn't really match what it expects. So it's getting a red Twizzler instead of a nice cup of tea. Um, and so as I said, like traceback and debug have become essential components for my toolbox in working with R. Um, both for my own scripts and projects as well as um, when trying to find and identify bugs in other people's packages. 
So that's, this is my general strategy is read the function that's giving me trouble, try to find other functions that call it as well as the other functions that it calls and use ours debugging tools to really dig into, um, into what's happening and find the source of the problem. Um, so when you've done all of those things and hopefully identified the source of a bug and how to fix it, then you can contribute that fix back to the maintainer of the package in the form of a pull request. So I've referenced this earlier, um, and I'll show now an example of a pull request. Um, so a pull request will give you a place to describe the change that you've made. Um, so this is a, an example of a pull request where I fixed a bug that was ca causing some text to be rotated in the wrong direction. And in the pull request, I reference the original uh, issue that was, that was opened on GitHub and then describe what the problem was and how my solution fixed it. Along with changes to the code when you're um, submitting a pull request, you'll need to update any documentation that, ha that has become out of date through the, um, through the change that you've made, if that's the case. Um, and you'll also want to include tests um, to ensure that the bug that you fixed doesn't get unfixed in the future. So many R packages come with a set of tests that are run automatically um, to ensure that things are working the way they're supposed to. And so if you're fixing a bug, um, clearly that has gotten past those suite of tests and so you wanna add one to make sure that um, the fix stays fixed. Um, we heard a little bit about code style earlier and it's really helpful when contributing to packages to follow the code style that is used in that package. That makes it much easier for the maintainer to review the code that's coming in and makes it much easier for anyone down the line who is reading that code um, to have a consistent way of, of um, seeing and interpreting what's there. Um, so those are some rules of thumb for contributing a pull request. Um, though some package maintainers have very specific uh, requests that they want to make of people who contribute, in that case, those are often described in a file called contributing.md, which will be stored within the GitHub repository. And so when in doubt, it's always, you always wanna follow what contribution guidelines the package maintainer has laid out for their specific package. Okay, so that is creating a pull request. So now you have identified a bug, you've opened an issue, you've written some fix and submitted the pull request. And at this point, you're probably super jazzed um, and excited to have made this contribution and probably anxious to see it incorporated right away. Um, and you may need to be a little bit patient um, because the person who maintains the package may not have time to address that fix right away. Um, hopefully, eventually, they will come back around to working on that, on that package um, and they'll see and accept your, your submission. Um, maybe there will be some back and forth, um, but hopefully that will get merged in eventually um, and you can revel in the satisfaction of seeing code that you wrote um, appear within, within this larger package. It's possible to that not, uh, that for any number of reasons, the package maintainer may not end up accepting your change. And in that case, um, it's not personal and I hope that uh, you, know, you still will have learned something by going through this process. Um, so it's not a waste of time to have worked on it. So that's the general process for contributing code uh, to a package, but I hope at this point I've showed that there are lots of different kinds of contributions that you can make to packages and that many of them don't require you to actually touch the code at all. You can open GitHub issues, you can contribute to existing issues, um, you can contribute documentation, all in addition to actually working on the code itself. Um, so keep in mind, of course, that the maintainers of our packages are people like you who have contributing, uh, competing demands on their time, um, but who want and need help from the community of people who use their packages um, in, order to, in order to keep them you know, up to date and working properly. And so if you take the time to help out on a package, no matter what shape that contribution takes, that can be deeply appreciated. And so this is a tweet from Bob Rudis, who's another very prolific package author, um, talking about how much he deeply appreciates all contributions, large and small, to the packages that he maintains. If you'd like to learn more about contributing to packages, I thought I'd share some additional great resources, and I think my slides um, have made it into Slack, and if not, I'll tweet them out um, later. 
Um, Mara Averick gave a great talk on contributing to the tidyverse at our studio conf. Um, Jim Hester also has a great blog post on this topic. And for the kind of nitty gritty details of how to use Git and GitHub, um, which were kind of out of, the, out of scope for this talk, but, um, but something that will be necessary at some point if you want to, um, if you want to contribute to packages, I highly recommend the happy Git and GitHub um, for the use R by Jenny Bryan. So as you're working in R from now on, I hope that you'll remember that without contributions to packages from users, um, this rich ecosystem of R packages that, that we have that's so impressive could not exist. Um, and that everything that you learn through this process benefits uh, not just the package that you're working on, um, but yourself and the R community as a whole. And so with that, I'd like to thank folks who have uh, helped me with this talk um, and give a shout out to our cat ladies. Since I had some, a couple dog photos on the earlier slides, I could not let this talk finish without, uh, without a few cats. Um, so I'd love to take any questions now if people have them. That's a great question. So for people, yeah, I'm going to repeat it. So um, for people who couldn't hear, the question was, how do you ensure that the issue that you want to be, that you want to work on isn't already be work, being worked on by someone else? Um, there are a couple of ways. So the, um, the issue labels that I showed, um, there's also sometimes a, a WIP, work in progress label, that um, maintainers will attach to an issue. When, uh, when it's being worked on. So if there's an issue that you're interested in, but it already has the WIP label, that probably means that someone else is working on it. Um, if, if it doesn't have that label, it doesn't mean that no one's working on it. So if you're interested in taking it on, um, it's totally fine to weigh in on the issue and say, hey, I'd be interested in working on this if no one, if no one else is. Like, would you be interested in a pull request? Um, and that's like a very reasonable thing to, to just write um, as a comment on the issue. Any other questions?